coming. Uh, we're very excited to be participating in Lifelong Tech. We've been long supporters of Jill and Robin's efforts okay. uh, through the Silver Summit oh in the past. Okay. Um, and I'm excited to bring the voice of the consumer into the conversation today. Um, I work in a small group within AARP. Does everyone know what AARP has? Has everyone heard of AARP? I like to ask because sometimes people don't, but um, we are a 50 plus member, uh, sh membership and advocacy organization. And my role within the organization is to help reach out to the private sector and to the marketplace to encourage them to build better solutions to meet the needs and wants and challenges of people as they age. Um, both our members and, and non-members, people just over 50. Uh, so one of the things that we think we can bring to the table, to the conversation, is the voice of the consumer into the innovation and design process. And so. Uh, because we have 37, 38 million members and they are utilizing technology in ways, in some ways that people don't even understand or, or can't even fathom, um, we're excited to bring them into the conversation and let them work directly with the innovators and also the investors that fund innovation and entrepreneurship in, in the states and globally so that better products come to market quicker, faster, um, and to, in our, our opinion, uh, that rises the tide for all boats and even better products that are either designed either consciously or sometimes unconsciously for the older de demographic can actually serve the larger mass population as, as well. So what I'd like to do is have our panelists introduce themselves, say a couple words about themselves, but really what I want this to be is sort of a dialogue and we'll leave some time um, in the end to get the opinions of uh, and have some questions from, from the, uh, the audience. But really what we're hoping to do here is to get somewhat a little, I would say, um, a bit skewed panel on the use of technology because um, our folks are, are participating in a program that we've put together where we're actually bringing in 50 AARP members and allowing them to go on a tour of many of the booths in, uh, down on the expo floor um, in the Lifelong Tech Digital Health and Fitness Pavilion and interact with the, the companies that way and give their opinions and learn about maybe technologies that they wouldn't have had experience with otherwise. So um, why don't we start on the end. Jerry, you want to say a couple words, introduce yourself to the crowd? Yeah, my name is Jerry Carter. I'm uh Member, AARP member, obviously. Um, I'm a long time Las Vegas resident, 30 plus years. Um, like many of the new swelling ranks of the AARP, I'm a, a very active, uh, physically active member. And so I guess, uh, in short, my, my hope coming here today is to see where technology is going in terms of um, data capture, data transmission, data integration with regard to the senior community and, and how we can use the data that we're gathering, that's being gathered, and the tools that are being used to gather that data to integrate that with our physicians, with our healthcare providers of other types, with our health insurance providers. Uh, it's, all, it's all very dynamic right now, I realize, and I'm just excited to see some of the tools that are coming down the pike and uh, the opportunity to talk about it. Hi, I'm Mary Liberati. I'm the Nevada State President for AERP, which is a volunteer position. Um, I actually live in the northern part of the state. I come from Carson City, which is our state capital. And I've been an AARP member for about 12 years now. I'm also retired from government. I worked for years with aging and disability services. Um, and so I see it, I have a 92-year-old father uh, that I just got a real pad for, Great. and uh, down to my children who are um, involved in technology, and my husband who uses technology for his um, activities. Uh, fitness activities. So uh, we're glad to be here today. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Wayne Madura, uh, also uh, Las Vegas. I've uh, been here about 30 plus years myself. Uh, I probably fall into a slightly different demographic. I've been actually with AARP for about 10 years, and I was one of the fortunate ones who got to join pretty much at age 45 as opposed to those 50. Did you got sneak to, in on a spouse? I got to piggyback off my wife who, <laughs> as of uh, two months ago, has moved into retirement and I am still in the workforce and still will be for quite a few years to come. So I kind of get the opportunity to look at it from a different perspective when I'm out looking at products is how is it not only going to affect me who actually is still in the workplace, but also how it's going to affect my wife who is now currently out of the workplace and what we need to do to combine technology to pretty much bring the two lives together and how it's gonna benefit both of us. So again, we are gonna be walking around CES asking questions and uh, again, we just wanna know how's, how's it gonna affect us on, on both sides of that curve. Excellent. I'm Mark Holzhauer. Um, I'm a five and a half year resident of Las Vegas. A retired attorney, worked for an, one of those terrible insurance companies you hear all the plaintiff's attorneys talk about on TV. Um, did a lot of uh, technology stuff 
growing in the business at the insurance company because we have obviously involved as much as we could. Uh, but we've come a long way since my 1969 Fortran class in programming. Um, and it's been an interesting ride to keep up with the technology and what I hope for is coming in the future. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Flagg. I'm a, also a longtime Las Vegas resident, an early retiree from a long university career, and now have opened my own small business. I, too, am here as a consumer to give uh, feedback on products that I'm seeing. I generally am very comfortable with technology, would generally say I'm not an early adopter, but I do follow new trends as they um, are announced in the media. Excellent. Excellent. Great. So I think we've got a great base here. Let's just do some quick statistics. How many of you own a desktop computer still? Okay. And a uh, laptop? A uh, tablet? You probably got one from mine. Yeah. Um, and then a smartphone? A flip phone? No? Very okay. So My clearly, wife has a flip phone. All right. So <laughs> clearly you guys are, are on top of these sorts of things. So um, if there was one thing you could change, let's say, um, about uh, your laptop to make it more um, applicable and, and efficient for, for what you need to do, what, what would you say that would be? Well, you know, I, I, I think talking about laptop, um, you know, you've got both Apple and you've got Windows. Mm -hmm. And as of, let's say, five years ago, there was no compatibility between the two. Um, my, my household is, is both. Uh, so we use pretty much uh, tablets Apple. Uh, we have uh, one desktop, which is Apple. I've pretty much grown up a PC guy myself. So of course, I'm more comfortable you know, using a window-based laptop. So for me, what I've seen most is, of course, we also use uh, Apple TV to generate everything we need to wirelessly through the television. Well, until really just about a month ago, I haven't been able to run anything through my laptop through an Apple device. Well, there's now programs that are coming online which, which allow me to do that, which not necessarily just streaming, but I can share, let's say, photos that I may have on my laptop that may not be, let's say, on my wife's Mac. Sure. So when we have friends over, of course, everybody likes to go through vacation photos, so we're the same, like to show it up on the television, and now we have that technology to do it both ways. So interoperability, the ability to, to, to link So my device. ability is to actually integrate uh, Apple products along with my window products. Okay, great, great. Did anyone else have any comment on, on or how, how often are you in, I would say, if you had to characterize the major um, utility that you use with your devices, what would it be? Would you characterize it as uh, managing your daily tasks? Is it communications? Um, Gaming, perhaps? What, uh, could, I, I know on ARP's website, the, the most hit web pages are always the gaming web pages, um, but uh, amongst all the information that we have. But what would you say, um, let's just go down the road. We can start with you, Nancy. What are you using these devices mostly for? I think like most people, it's uh, email communication, social networking, and um, functional apps for banking, financial issues. Great, I'll come back to that. Um, mine, I think, mainly is financial. Uh, and uh, communication. I've tried to stay away from a lot of the social networking because it takes so much time away from the day. So I've limited that. Um, You've been reading I, my Twitter, haven't you? <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, presentations, I, I work part-time now, and presentations that I do, um, and my finances, the taxes, you know, all that sort of stuff. Sure, sure, sure. And of course, with my time still being quite limited, uh, I use it for both, uh, of course, communications, everything from the email, but also just to make my life easier as far as I do home banking. Um, I, I don't walk into a bank much anymore. Uh, everything is done either through, actually through every device I have. I, I do uh, banking through, through phone, through laptop, through tablet. Uh, another thing that actually I, I use it for is may not sound important to some, but my thermostat, when you're out of town, you're coming in town, I can actually, over my phone, pretty much anywhere between here and California, adjust my thermostat in my house so I get it to where I need it to be. Summertime, get it cool before I walk through the door. Wintertime, get it warm before I walk through the door. <laughs> awesome. Well, communications is probably the number one thing. My children don't answer my phone calls, but they'll answer every text I send them. So, uh, a lot of texting going on. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, 
email, of course, but um, my husband does the banking. I don't do any banking. I let him do it. He does it electronically, but I do the shopping. I mean, I'm surprised nobody said that. I love to shop online, so, uh, you know, because I can do it at midnight. I can do it at 3 in the morning. I can do it at noon. I don't stand in lines. It's great. So um, that's one of the big areas that I like to use it for. Um, I, I, use, I use technology routinely, and I, I, I'm still in the workforce, and in the, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm IT manager. Um, so I use technology. It provides me the opportunity to, to not be at my office um, as often as it would be otherwise. I can telecommuting. It's a huge part of my daily life. Being able to use my tablet, use my smartphone, use my laptop to be able to uh, work from home, work from on the road, wherever I'm going to be, I can, I can manage, manage staff, manage resources pretty easily. And as technology grows, it's just so many opportunities are out there now for, for adding to that capability and being able to do more of that. Um, and then on top of that, I'm also I'm a, I'm a late starter in terms of family, so I have two young children. And being able to keep tabs on them, uh, particularly with spatial tools, being able to use GPS and, and spatial technology to be able to keep track of where my kids are in a given moment. That's great. That's great. So I, I'd like to, to touch on, um, I'm very encouraged and excited you're all using um, uh, the technology for, for managing your finances. Um, and I want to try to juxtapose that sort of with um, the stereotype that folks, um, older folks are very nervous about sharing. And you, you touched on this at your opening comments, Jerry, about their health and data, health data online. Um, there's a story that I've heard from a bunch of talks that, you know, if uh, people were, had two things that were going to fall out of their garbage and be left on their, their driveway for a whole day, uh, one being their financial records, one being their health records, they'd rather, have, they'd rather go out and scoop up their financial records rather than their health records. But in terms of actual um, activities and ad adoption, people are more, much more comfortable transacting financially online, managing their portfolio or their finances, um, rather stereotypically or mythologically, their, their health data. So w I've been surprised in other conversations that I've had with our members where they're actually adopting um, uh, electronic health records and private health records ahead of me, and it's my job to be on top of these things. So I, I just love to go down the line and see how your feelings are sort of about data, data uh, uh, privacy and, and, and encryption, but also where it really delves into and crosses over with your health, your health information. Um, start with Mary's raising her hand. Well, I just wanted to say that um, my father is 92, and you can imagine over the years he has had surgeries and different doctors, and he just went to a new doctor last month and it took us eight pages of information, eight hard copies to get all the information down that he needed. You know, how, how great it would be to have had that on some kind of a mobile device that, um, I mean, it's help, it would be helpful for us just remembering all the information, but also for the doctor's office, if they had the ability to read that information, uh, because it just took us hours to get ready just for a doctor appointment, which mm -hmm. was ridiculous. But, you know, trying to get all that information together, uh, like I said. Now, in your particular case, your 92-year-old father, do you, would he express any concerns, do you think, about having that information uh, digitized? Or is he just looking for the most convenient way to get through the, the health experience? Convenience, convenience sure. uh, is more. Uh, you know, my own fear is about, uh, I, I hate the location thing, I have to say. Hmm. Like, I don't let my phone have my location, because I don't want everybody to know where I am every minute of my day. Um, you know, that to me is more than my health information. I had cancer a few years ago. And so, you know, I like to have my information and I share it with people. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a personal problem with that on personal health information. And I liked, I went to a new doctor who was in the same group. He brought up some, some records that I had from three or four years before of tests that I had had. And that was so great that he could, he could see where I was several years before and where I was at this point. So for me, it was convenience and I don't have any problem with it. Yeah, I've got a 90-year-old sister. I'm the youngest in the family, and she's got dementia. And to be able to take the doctor records, you know, she's moved when I've moved because I take care of her. Sure. Um, to have the doctors be able to access that electronically by giving them a certain password so they access all or part of the records. And for myself, if I'm out of town traveling and I have to go to the hospital and I'm, you know, unconscious, to have my wife be able to give them a code and then go in and see all my medical records going back would be fantastic. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I belong to a health program that has a wellness component, and I'm already tracking uh, medical information through that uh, wellness program. I have to say it's fairly tedious to constantly go in and have to enter every doctor's appointment 
and that sort of thing. If there were more of a, an automatic interface, it would probably be a little more helpful to me, but I don't have generally any privacy concerns with having that information there. Uh, the insurer generally knows all that information anyway. Mm -hmm. I'd have to say I'm generally not using all of the little wellness programs except when they mandate that I complete certain ones to stay in the program. Now, and, and actually one I've been impressed with myself just, just using is, uh, I think as far as, as, as like metabolic testing all go, I, I'm guessing, but I would say like Quest Diagnostics is probably the largest one out there. Uh, again, on the smartphone, I know Quest Diagnostics has an app that I, I get to see my test results before the doctor's office ever calls you to come in. Um, so not only can I take a look at those test results myself and go over it and know what I'm prepared for instead of going in saying, okay, what are they going to tell me? I, I already have that knowledge. And on top of it, where you touched it about being out of town, at, at any time, I, I can pull up that app and pull up a, a test, blood test result that I had five years ago. Sure. And, it's, and it's all you know, on, on their database. I, I just open it up through a portal. Mm -hmm. So again, things like that just, you know, if you ever a have to be out of town, you have an emergency, you actually have that information at your fingertip as, as long as you have your phone with you. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's, I, I can add to that actually. That's, that's a really good point. I, I do a lot of things outdoors actively, cycling, triathlons, et cetera, and I routinely capture metrics that are, that are monitoring my performance. If I had the ability to actually transmit that live data, and this, this could be extrapolated out to the rest of the AARP retirement or se senior community, um, not just active folks, but folks who want to keep their, their health information at their fingertips available to their physicians, to their, the healthcare provider, to their health insurance companies. I mean, how many times do you, have you gotten mailing from your health insurance company saying, provide us information about this incident that you experienced? And it, it was just a, uh, I went for a physical, and they've got no information about it. They want me to tell them what I told, what I met with my doctor about. If I had the information that I could transmit live in real time or at my discretion to to the, uh, my health insurance company, to a uh, physical uh, physician, it would be terrific. I'd, I'd be so much far ahead of the game instead of having to go into a doctor's office with an appointment and wait three hours because they're they're way so behind schedule because so many other patients have come in with the need to provide information about what their status is and what they're there for. Um, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm hearing at least convenience trumps privacy concerns. So long, you don't want things to be out there in the open f for no good reason, but you're willing to put up the, with that risk um, to, to help have a, an easier and better experience, especially in the healthcare um, experience. So you guys all sort of touched on it. I see, Nancy, you're wearing a tracker. So um, I, do you, are you guys familiar with the term quantified self? It's sort of the jargony term of, of, of measuring all different bits of biometric data, and even non-biometric data. I would say the location-based services that, that I've been using for years are almost a different way. I, I, for some reason, I get a kick out of saying, in fact, this morning when I checked in at the, uh, the Nevada State Office that it's been a year since I was there, because I was there for this program last year. But you all seem to have at least some elements of, of self-tracking going on. What, what sort of things do you use? How do you utilize the data that you get out of it? What are areas of your life that you think might be more um, enriched if you knew more information about what was going on? Uh, Jerry, you sound to be all, all over this with your, your training. Um, I, I do, and it's, that's come a long ways just in the last five, 10 years, being able to, again, capture those metrics that are, that are assessing your performance, assessing your health. There's heart rate monitors and, and, and uh, other, other metric gatherers that, that are gathering that vital information that, that tells me, as, a, as a, an athlete, how I compare to the previous year, to the previous week, to the previous day. So I know, I can, I can see if there's an issue, for example, and this can be extended to other folks who are not doing these sorts of things, they're, just, they're living their day-to-day -day lives. They can be aware if there's a glitch in their health situation, if there's something going on, they've got some issue with their cardiovascular system that needs to be addressed. That can be transmitted to a physician in a heartbeat. They've got it right there in their hands and they can see what needs to be addressed. Anyone else have that? I just wanted to say something that's a little off tangent here, but my husband uses a Fitbit, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I think has really helped his exercise is he has his, um, a device that lets him swim with his shuffle, 
And so, you know, ex, uh, I don't know what you call that, auxiliary um, products, I think are helpful too, because not only the data, but something that makes it enjoyable uh -huh. here, while you're doing whatever you're doing, swimming or running or, or whatever. Uh, and I just wanted to throw that out. Josh, there's, um, there's a, a company that we've interacted with a bit that's, that's doing quite well called BitGym, and they have extremely high resolution um, walking tours that are on a, you can put on a tablet or iPad. So when you're in your, your home gym or at, at the, the regular gym on a treadmill, you have this immersive experience down a Swiss Alp trail just mm -hmm. to take your mind off of the yeah, fact exactly. that you're in this room with no windows and people are sweating all around you and that sort of thing. But uh, Yeah, you know, and I personally tried different types of tracking devices. I'll be honest to say I don't usually track things when I'm at home or, or locally. I uh, use a lot of different apps yeah, when, when I'm out traveling because I like to see the different elevations I may have walked or the distance I've walked the time I, 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 I've gone through. Um, but again, when something new comes out, it's like, oh, okay, I'll try it. I'm currently wearing a smart watch, which is a, uh, a Pebble a Pebble watch. Sure. Uh, one of the things that actually touted was it, it shows you a sleep pattern. Um, again, not that I was really interested in it, but it keen my interest. Mm -hmm. um, so used it for a week. It actually shows your movements while you're sleeping and it downloads it to an app which you can download a graph ev even onto your laptop. Um, did I find it useful for me personally? Not not really. Sure. Uh, but again, it's just if, if you're an information hound, it's, it's, it's something very good for you. Um, so as far as the tracking part, again, I, I probably don't use it as much as some others might. Yeah, just uh, before I, I'll cut you off for a second, Nancy, we're, we're actually very excited. Um, our group within ARP, the Thought Leadership Group, has just launched um, a six-week study with, in coordination with uh, Georgia Tech Research Institute on activity and sleep trackers. And um, what we found is people f do find that they don't sleep as well as they think they do, and, and there are tremendous studies nowadays about how that can affect your waking hours as well as the next night's sleep. But unfortunately, the solutions that are out there, for the most part, don't tell you what to do to change. They establish a pattern, but don't really coach you on how to, how to improve that. Yeah, just kind of to add on that, again, I probably fall into a slightly different demographic. Um, as, as, as opposed to tracking my sleep, yes, I already know my, my sleep is horrible. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a swing shift worker. My bedtime is, is 4 a.m. And I can wake up, I may get five, six, hours at the most so do I already know my sleep pattern is absolutely horrible yes I do did my per se watch confirm it it absolutely did <laughs> sure. so but sure. I don't know if it can change anything for me right. Nancy, I'm sorry. I was an early adopter of Fitbit and I love it for me the big decisions about it were the fact that it's uh, wearable at all times I was a longtime user of um, oh, other regular pedometer yeah regular pedometer <laughs> Um, but I like that it's waterproof and the price point uh, was a major selling point for me. On a daily basis, I use Map My Run app and use that to track all sorts of workouts and also the Couch to 5K and Couch to 10K programs. Good for you, Chris. Cool. I'm a scuba diver and with the electronic watch, uh, the depth meter and everything, uh, mm -hmm. the dive meter. It downloads to the computer. I can track how I've changed over the years, how it's getting better or worse. Um, but the one thing that I'm looking forward to, and it may be out there and I haven't found it yet, is tracking for my 90-year-old sister with dementia. So that I can see when she says something has happened, I can go in and see where she was at that particular time. Did that really happen? Is she inventing the imaginary person who mm -hmm. pushed her down? Um, and just to see what exercise she's getting just to try and keep her healthy in her dementia. Yep. There, there are some interesting solutions on market, um, watch-based ones, that specifically looking at Alzheimer's and, and dementia patients. But and this uh, is within a, a senior facility, so I wonder mm -hmm. if the facility might you know, adopt something like that too so they can track their people. Yep, so we've, we've touched on a couple different areas around caregiving and caregiving technology, and a couple of you are you know, in charge of someone else's well-being. Wh where, what are things that might help more? You know, we. Um, uh, ARP is, is uh, launch, launching a, a relationship with a company called CareZone, which helps care coordination, especially with um, adult children that are at different geological, uh, uh, geographical, I should say, um, lo locations. But what, what are the other elements when it comes to caring for someone, either older or younger, that, that aren't being met, met for you? Uh, I can actually, I, my uh, mother-in-law, um, uh, currently in hospice, uh, been in uh, a care, memory care facility, uh, we're going on two years now. 
um, uh, brought her up from Arizona to Las Vegas two years ago, so she is local, and you know we can visit, keep an eye on her, kind of that way. Um, what I feel is, is is being dropped again in this technology world that we live in. It shouldn't take a phone call or it shouldn't take a drive over to the facility to see what what's going on. You know, uh, there should be something out there to again a portal an app. I can open up, I can see, hey, did she eat today? Did she, you know, all those kind of information that I, I deem important when, when we have somebody under, un, under care mm -hmm. that instead of trying to get an individual, well, I'm sorry, that person's at lunch, can you call back? There should be something I can just look up without actually having to talk to somebody to find out any, any information almost, almost on real time mm -hmm. of, of what I need to know. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think that one, I can add to that. that, that I hadn't considered that before, but I, when I think about um, something that you attribute mainly to Hollywood, you see uh, law enforcement tracking somebody's whereabouts, tracking their progress on a, city, a network of city streets, for example. Why not use that same kind of technology, which really exists. I mean, GPS provides that opportunity for, for uh, anybody to use now. I track my kids where they're going with the use of their smartphones. Um, they don't realize it. but. Uh, you can use the same kind of technology, integrate it with the same sort of metrics that you can capture with some of the Fitbit devices and other, other wearable devices, for example, that might be monitoring health information and be able to track where somebody is, an elderly person who might be uh, out on a walk, and you can find out exactly where they are. And that, that information, in turn, can be actually sent directly to a, a first responder if there's a need so that they can be on the spot and there's little time lost. So we don't have much time left. I'm torn which way to go. I, I want to call attention to the fact that this conversation is mainly about things that you guys have all been offering to pay out of pocket. We haven't talked about reimbursement whatsoever for any of these, these devices or technologies. So that could be a whole other panel. We could do that next year maybe, Jill. Uh, and secondarily, um, just one quick question, because I think it might be relevant to the folks that are in maybe building companies that are in the audience, but where do you guys typically learn about these new technologies? You all seem to be, even you claim not to be an early adopter, but I heard some early adoption going on there. But where do you typically get your information about these sorts of devices? Is it all the news reports from CES, or is it? It's news reports, it's networking, it's uh, Googling. Sure. You know, it's, it's searching it out and trying to figure out the terms, talking to other people who have people in the same situation. Like, you know, we could talk and see what's going on between her father and my sister, um, and just, it's the network. So that, that bears out things that I've heard in other conversations with, with our members is that um, while the younger demographic might search out technology for technology's sake, you all are looking for solutions to, to real problems, uh -huh. and then you'll find the technology that, that suitably addresses those. Is yeah, that I can't safe tell you the last time I played a game online, but I use it for practical application sure. more in my life than I used to. Fair enough. Does that hold for the whole crew? Well, yeah, my husband, when he got the thing to swim with, you know, it was one person started, and next thing I knew, everybody in the pool had one. Okay. You know, I mean, it's kind of word of mouth. Bumping too. into each other. and Well, <laughs> they, they go, where'd you get that? You know, and it's like. Great, great. Oh, 13 seconds left. Joe, I'll give you 13 <laughs> seconds back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get your back out. Well, if you could give a round of, hand, uh, round of applause yeah. to thank for that. <laughs> And just so, just so you know, if you guys want to share, share this information, we, we videotape every one of our sessions and post it. Um, I don't know, give us two weeks to <laughs> post and add titles and everything. But we, we, people come to our website, Lifelong Tech Summit, all year round to you know, learn more about these sessions and rewatch them again if you have questions. So thank you very much. Thank you all for being a part of this. <laughs>